So a, quick, a couple of quick notes on just strain gauges, and you would have come across these in some of your testing lab classes. It's obviously a device used to measure strain, keeping in mind that strain is a unitless number. And so generally it's something that has a flexible backing. It's going to be adhered to a surface. Right? That's where the plane stress problems come in. And it supports a metallic foil. And so the deformation that occurs in those foils changes the resistance uh, inside the game, the electrical resistance. So again, to use this, you're going to need some electricity. And generally a combination of these three gauges is what we call a rosette. And when you have three strain gauges, you'll be able to calculate the initial state of strain. Uh, sometimes we'll have problems that have just one gauge, two gauges, and then also three gauges. So here's a look at a strain gauge. Right, there's an, it's got a, um, something that adheres it to a material. And what this gauge is going to capture is strain along the axis of the gauge. So you see the coils, the terminals, and so we've got electricity that's going to be connected to them. Right, the resistance is going to be measured by this device. And then a gauge factor is going to turn around and tell us what the strain actually is. And so here's just a little bit with, right, we've got something that's bonded to the material there. And then the material is going to go through some extremely small deformation. When we've got three gauges, then we'll call that a rosette. And there are different types of rosettes. This would be a 4590 or a 45 degree rosette. So we've got something where 45 degrees separates all three of the gauges. So the equation for the strain gauge, we had actually just a minute ago, and we had derived it by kinematics. So we had related the strain Right, on a rotated axis back to some initial state of strain and it's related by some angle theta so as we get ready to analyze strain gauges the strain in the gauge i is related to some initial strains and angle that the gauge makes with the axis so a little bit of bookkeeping here we're going to measure theta always from some x-axis and positive will be when the angle of the gauge with the x-axis would form a positive slope right looking at a horizontal axis here we would end up with a theta i which would be negative again measured from some initial axis so you kind of turn your head a little bit and we would end up with a negative slope in relation to the x-axis. So there we'd have theta i as a negative value. Right? So it has to be measured from a clearly defined coordinate system, and it just needs to remain consistent. And so that theta right, is going to relate back to the initial strain, so some epsilon xx, epsilon yy, and a gamma xy. So again, just keeping our bookkeeping nice and steady. So we'll take a look at a couple rosettes. This would be a picture of a typical 45 degree rosette. And so you see angles that are going to form here of 45 and 45 degrees. So you can also have a 60 degree rosette. I mean, you can have a rosette at any orientation. You just need to know those angles. Again, notice that for what we talk about with theta here, for the theta of each of these gauges, Right, A, B, and C, it's going to be relative to some reference axis system, so the x-axis. So for epsilon A on the 45 degree, it's 0. B would be plus 45. Epsilon C, right, the strain equation for gauge C, would end up with a theta equal to positive 90 degrees. Let's take a look at the 60 degree rosette, again, using the axis that has been applied. So we would have again zero because the A gauge is sitting right on the x-axis, plus 60, 
plus 120. And we can use those to solve for the initial strain. This would be three equations, three unknowns. You'd end up solving a system of equations using coefficient matrix, an unknown column vector, and then a right-hand side. So here's the equation for the strain gauge that's on your equation sheet. So you want to take a look at it. Now, this is the actual form of it. And so we see some 1, 1, 2, 2. We see an epsilon, 2 epsilon. And remember that epsilon relates to gamma. So the way I would encourage you to perhaps apply it would be using, if we talk about gauge A, I'm going to go back and call that epsilon xx cosine squared, epsilon yy, and then gamma xy. And then afterwards, you've got sine theta a and cosine theta a. So all I've done is, instead of using ones and twos here, I've gone back and reapplied with this xy coordinate. Again, but remembering that theta right, is intimately tied to what we've called the x, uh, the x direction here, right? Theta is going to be measured from the x-axis. So this will get us through a lot of our strain gauge um, problems. We'll also end up using more circle to solve for these as well. So uh, there would be epsilon, right? There would be the gauge A, so gauge B, going to relate back to x and y direction. And again, theta B is the angle from the x-axis to gauge B, again, with the plus-minus orientation as well. And so there would be an, uh, an equation for gauge C. So you just want to tie this thing back. That's what's sitting on your equation sheet. And so the interpretation of that, perhaps you might want to use x's there, y's there, turn this back into x, y, and just call it gamma. But again, it's kind of up to you how you want to apply it.